Hey there, guys. Welcome back to yet another episode of your favorite red light therapy podcast, The Red Light Report. And as you can see in the title of the episode, this is part two of a very illuminating two-part podcast episode series <laughs> and uh, of evidence-based biohacking. And if you listen to the prior episode, then you listen to that intro, you know what to expect with this this episode, the second episode. If you didn't, I highly recommend that you go back and listen to the prior episode, part one, with Elias Arjan, who goes really deeply into evidence biohacking and why that's important. And he superficially touches on the research study that BioLite did with BioStrap Labs. In this second episode of the two-part series, we're going to go much deeper into the results of that study with BioLite. Very exciting results, something we didn't necessarily anticipate, but extremely exciting nonetheless. So Kevin's going to go into that for us. Kevin Longoria, who is the chief science officer of, of BioStrap. Uh, so the first part of this episode, Kevin and I are going to talk about biometrics even a little more deeply than we did with Elias. So we're going to talk about biometrics, why they're important, especially heart rate variability and the insight that that can really give you into your instantaneous and potentially future, you know, health and wellness and the implications that they have uh, and kind of the future of where wearables such as BioStrap and the biometrics that they give you and kind of what the future has in store for us. And then the second half of this episode is going to be about BioLite and the cool results we got with BioStrap Labs. So I'm not going to give any spoilers here, but just know it's exciting results. And I'm just really proud of BioLite, my company, for, for taking the step forward and investing in research on our specific products. BioLite would be the first red light therapy LED panel company to invest into research on our own products. We didn't know what results we were going to get. We didn't know if they're going to be great or good or neutral, but we wanted to invest in research and kind of move the needle forward with BioLite and, you know, being the leader of this company and being a researcher myself and being a scientist, being a physical therapist with a background in science, it was important for me to invest in research and kind of move the photobiomodulation or the red light therapy research forward and help it progress in any way I can help out. Needless to say, we got some cool results, some very unique novel results that I think are really going to spark some interesting and forward thinking research in the future for red light therapy, whether that's BioLite or, or other researchers. So I'm excited for you guys to listen to this episode. Please enjoy, learn lots, and see what your BioLite red light therapy device can do for you in a simple 10-minute session. Welcome to the Red Light Report, your number one source for all things red light therapy, where you will learn how to optimize your health, wellness, and longevity with the power of photobiomodulation. I'm your host, Dr. Mike Belkowski. All right, guys, welcome back to the Red Light Report. We're in part two of this two-part episode of really digging into the research and evidence-based biohacking. And then, so we talked about that with Elias Arjan on, on part one, where, where again, he digged into the importance of evidence-based biohacking, whereas right now it's relatively the wild, wild west, unregulated and different products or companies can kind of tout their, their technology or what have you. But like Elias alluded to in the previous episode, products and companies need to start validating or providing some evidence for what they're selling to consumers. So if you haven't listened to that episode, go check it out. Um, it was last week's episode. And so that was part one, which was a segue into part two this week with Kevin Longoria, who worked with Elias at Biostrap. Kevin is still there, but uh, Kevin is going to help us dig into the study that BioLite did with BioStrap Labs this previous summer, and we got some pretty cool results. So again, Elias touched on the need for validation. BioLite took that step and did some validation, some study, some research with, with BioStrap Labs, which Kevin will dig into. But let's talk about Kevin and his background. 
Uh, he is an expert in the field of clinical physiology with an emphasis in cardiopulmonary and nervous system-based approaches to optimizing health and athletic performance. Early in his career as chief science officer for a progressive neuroscience company, Kevin led validation studies and developed and implemented nervous system-based training systems for various populations, ranging from severely compromised health to corporate wellness initiatives and professional athletic organizations. Currently, Kevin is the chief science officer of Biostrap, which is a digital health company that has evolved from being a consumer wearable into a comprehensive health monitoring platform with a mission to improve human health on a global scale. And uh, without further ado, Kevin, thanks for making time in your busy schedule to hop on the podcast here and speak with the audience. Yeah, Mike, thanks for having me. It's re really great to be here. Um, I'm not nearly as cool as my bio makes me sound, so I hope I don't let people down. <laughs> yeah, no, no, it's a pleasure. And I'm grateful that you were able to be a part of the Biostrap Labs situation with, with BioLite and have your expertise and knowledge kind of looking through the numbers and the data and, and pulling that together. So we'll get to that in a second here, or at least um, in a couple of minutes here. But give us some background on yourself from what I didn't tell people, just a background on how you got to where you are today. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So um, prior to this, as you mentioned, I, I was the chief science officer for a progressive neuroscience company. And, and our goal there was to develop and validate these models based on biometric data, um, essentially to improve, you know, neuromuscular disease uh, management, as well as uh, training elite athletes. So essentially, I, I went on this journey, I was looking for the world's most reliable biosensor, right? And this is really where the commercial wearable industry falls short, and, and not about putting down the competitors, but as a clinician, when I'm building a program, modifying a program, perhaps, you know, as extreme as modifying medications based on this data, the integrity of such becomes extremely important. And I sourced every wearable most people have ever heard of, and then some, and at the time had access to a multi-million dollar laboratory and, and eventually gave up on the project. I just thought the wearable industry was not there. Um, one day I stumbled across this little uh, company out of California called Biostrap, and found you know, a small company competing with Apple Watch was, was producing higher fidelity PPG data. So essentially I sourced the technology, I started implementing it primarily on the athletic side, went on to win uh, about six world championships in the UFC, it was on the, the Joe Rogan podcast of the world and stuff too, had a, had a great ride there, but I couldn't you know, keep my mind off of what I could do here with Biostrap, right? The ability to remotely monitor our patients, have access to this high quality data around the clock is extremely appealing to all clinicians, so basically what I wanted to do was put my efforts into research and development, build some algorithms on top of that, and really try to deliver on the unfulfilled promises of digital health, right? We've all talked about wearables and telemedicine and remote physiologic monitoring, and the promise is that it's supposed to decrease cost, increase efficiency, improve access to care, and ultimately improve patient outcomes. And I'll tell you, wearable technology has been around a long time, and uh, human health, and specifically health in the United States, has only progressively gotten worse. And that's because no one's really taken the time to create specificity out of this data, right? We're, we're wearing our Apple Watch, but we're just using it to check our text messages and play our Spotify. We're not really utilizing it as, as a health tool, you know, not, not the best one because of the data integrity, but really that's how, how we position BioChef. We are, you know, positioned to basically provide the right professionals with the right data to make the right decisions. So is BioStrap more for the consumer or like you're saying, is it more for medical professionals to gather data like you're saying, whether it's for studies or for their patients or, or whatnot? Yeah, it's both is the best answer. We have a you know intrinsic mission and goal to provide this data to everybody. The, the most comparable device on the market is about $1,600 MSRP. So really end consumers do not have access to this medical grade wearable. And so we keep up our web store. We don't do a whole lot of marketing, you know, to, to be honest, to, towards the end consumer, but it's available there for them. Um, where we have seen widespread adoption is where data integrity really matters. And that's going to be in clinical research and more in the medical field in general. Um, in the last, call it year, we've you know, landed large studies with the National Institute of Health, major pharmaceutical trial companies. We're doing some research in the space industry that's touching 128 countries right now. So it's really, you know, anybody that's done their due diligence to compare Biostrap versus other technologies uh, tends to pick Biostrap every time. You know, I'm, I'm a little biased, but uh, it's starting to speak for itself. Yeah. And that's what I've heard from a lot of other biohackers or, or high profile influencers in the health and wellness space is you ask them, do they choose Biostrap versus Aura, Biostrap versus Whoop, Biostrap versus Fitbit? 
And yeah, nine times out of 10 or nine times out of nine, they're saying Biostrap because of what you've alluded to with, with the accuracy, how consistent the results are. And like you're saying, using biometrics is an important asset that people don't utilize enough or it's underutilized. Like you're saying with the Apple Watch, you might use it to check the time or your text, but you're not really using it to make day-to-day -day decisions about your health. Give us a, some insight with your expertise in how certain biometrics can play um, a predictive role in day-to-day -day decision making for for one's health. Yes, absolutely. So, really, what wearables and digital health provides is a an individualized approach. Right in the medical field, we're forced to rely on universal binning because this data doesn't exist, and so therefore we say your resting heart rate should be 60 to 100, and that means you can present to the emergency room with a heart rate of 98 beats per minute, and that's theoretically fine without any insight that your normal resting heart rate is 52 because you're a well-trained athlete, right? That would be a huge acute change. So really it's just about establishing your baseline, monitoring your individual trends over time. And probably the, the best use case, very practical and timely is our ability to detect things like respiratory illness early. Um, we've been doing various different studies. Basically when we have your physiological set point, you know your normal resting heart rate, your normal respiratory rate, heart rate variability, oxygen saturation, all of these different metrics. Now we can basically score risk based on variation from your individual baseline. Um, we've basically shown this to date. We have shown that we can predict respiratory illness on average 1.7 days prior to symptom onset, which is going to help with, you know, decreasing the spread and all of that as well. 1.7 days prior to your symptom onset, uh, to date, we have not missed a single case. Your physiology will tell the data well before the symptoms will onset because that's all a function of the change in physiology, right? So really understanding the, the data trends and what's a good trend versus a bad trend. And, and to me, that's the biggest issue with the consumers and something we're trying to take on. You have to understand the data to value it and to really make day-to-day -day decisions based upon it. I try to make the case all of the time and I can stand behind it all day why heart rate variability is more important than you get that little number on the scale or the blood pressure you take twice a year at your doctor's when you're nervous. But I'm trying to tell you, basically, that little number of heart rate variability that you've never heard of is more important than how you look naked in a mirror. I mean, I understand it's an aesthetic world and everything, but from a health perspective, I can defend that all day, every day. Getting into perhaps what people can value a little bit more day to day, um, understanding kind of like the difference between the stressor phase and physiological adaptation. We're type A's, we go to the gym, we put in our miles, we, we break our bodies down. This is the stressor. It's absolutely necessary to elicit the response, but the response that we seek, muscular hypertrophy, all of these types of things, you know, better health, better longevity, primarily occur during phases of sleep and recovery. And so now side note, we should train to basically sleep and recover better as opposed to vice versa, but you can utilize this data, things like your heart rate variability, your sleep uh, quality and, all, and such, to actually determine your body's physiological readiness. Say, today is a good day to make adaptation, and so I'm going to go break my body down a little bit more. Or you wake up and you had poor sleep and you know below average heart rate variability, and you say, I'm actually at an increased risk of injury today. I don't quite feel that great. It's a better day to focus on something like active recovery, you know, something like some LLLP. Let's get recovered so I can hit it harder the next day. You made a lot of great points there, which elicits a lot of questions for me. But HRV, in a nutshell, is basically a measurement of your, your nervous system, correct? The higher your HRV, the more you know tapped into your parasympathetic nervous system you are, whereas the lower it is, the more sympathetic driven you are, fight or flight, which is great in small chunks, but you want to spend the most of your time in the parasympathetic mode, correct? You know, that, that's where there's a little, you know, call it ambiguity and misunderstanding. Higher is not always necessarily better. And so this is where, you know, it gets a little, little difficult to uh, understand here. But basically, heart rate variability is the measurement of the tug of war between your sympathetic and your parasympathetic. Every time we breathe in, our heart rate should speed up a little bit. And when we breathe out, it should slow down. This is called respiratory sinus arrhythmia. We want a lot of variability because this shows that this game of tug of war is being adequately played. Um, basically, we want both systems functioning properly in the right balance. And so when we look at heart rate variability, there's SDNN, RMS, SD, a lot of different, you know, call them um, time domain uh, analyses there. In general, you want to be high, but you don't want to see a lot of change day to day. And if my normal is 60 milliseconds, I don't want to be 98 tomorrow. because That just means that I had some sort of acute change. Over time, with proper lifestyle modification, you want to see a steady upwards trend. But really, the primary goal is to be resilient. 
And that is dictated by little change in your day-to-day -day values. So if you go break your body down, you shouldn't go to zero. You should go down a few points, right? And this is just showing that you're more adept to deal with stressors. Then you get into frequency domain, and that's where you can actually start to look a little bit into the, the actual sympathetic versus parasympathetic, whereas the milliseconds time domain is really just, is it balanced in general? So this was, I guess, a second part to my question. That was a great explanation. So for example, I have a bio strap. My wife has a bio strap. And my HRV on average or on a good day is, is in the 80s, whereas my wife, hers is up in the 100s, 110s, 120s. So does that mean she is more tapped into her, her parasympathetic nervous system or is it different from person to person? And like you're saying, it's about how it is on a day-to-day -day basis. And then based on what you did the day prior, that's going to dictate that HRV. And it's kind of more individual than comparing an absolute number. You know, you, you can do somewhat of a side-by-side -side comparison. I'll tell you if those are your values, those are both pretty excellent. So nothing to worry about in general. Um, but on average, males should actually have a slightly higher heart rate variability. Specifically, I, I know you're looking at RMSSD because that's what Bioshock reports. Um, so you should actually have a slight leg up, but then there's age and there's lifestyle and all that type of things that factor in. Which she's, ours, a, she's a very patient, calm person. So it makes sense that hers is higher. <laughs> <laughs> she lets you have an awesome podcast room in your house too. That's, she's a winner. <laughs> But yeah, no, it, it's mostly hard to say who has a lower risk of cardiovascular disease based on those numbers or anything like that. But imagine tracking your data for the next 15 years and understanding your, your changes in slopes and things like that. That's really where the magic of, of heart rate variability tracking comes in. Gotcha. So obviously adapting consistent healthy lifestyle habits should have an upward trend. And I think, it was it Tim Gray or someone else I interviewed? shoot, I forget who it was, but they noticed a seasonal trend in their HRV. Is that something that you've noticed or are familiar with? Yeah. Yeah. It's actually something we're looking into a bit right now. What we're primarily focused on is actually daylight savings. Um, there's, there's interesting when you lose an hour, gain an hour, there's, there's very obvious changes in sleep patterns. That's a little bit more intuitive, but heart rate variability reports of mood and things like that too. So we're studying that um, seasonally, I think makes sense. You know, any type of climate change will have an acute effect on your heart rate variability. But looking at, you know, our, call it tens of thousands of users and being able to kind of like digital phenotype that a little bit, it's, it's something we, we've thought about, but haven't really looked into quite yet. Gotcha. Outside of the obvious stressors of daily life, let's say exercise, diet, mental stress, what have you noticed that affects the biometrics the most, maybe specifically HRV, since that's what we're talking about? Yeah. So, you know, heart rate variability is essentially a non-specific proxy for stress, inflammation, and immune function. So I, I think you nailed the big ones there. Um, exercise, nutrition, just kind of consistency and movement outside of, you know, touching weights and things like that. Hydration plays a huge role. And then really environment. So it's a, it's a great, you know, understanding when you do travel to high altitude, that's going to have a pretty big uh, acute effect on things like your heart rate variability. And then I, I really could make the case that, you know, mental, you know, wellness is probably one of the most important. You will undoubtedly realize when you had a stressful day, even if you didn't go anywhere near the gym, how that can have an acute impact on things like your heart rate variability as well. Um, we're, we're actually doing some, some pretty interesting studies right now with, uh, with veterans, uh, you know, PTSD and such. You know, how do you create more specificity of the heart rate variability? How do you predict specific exacerbations and such? This podcast interview was brought to you by the Longev Revive Cream. If you haven't heard of this cream before, go back and listen to the podcast interview with David Horneck, one of the people that helped create this amazing cream. The cream is specifically developed to enhance red light therapy treatment sessions. And not only that, but improve vibrational healing from the frequencies of full spectrum sunlight. The Revive includes special ingredients such as photodynamic amino acids, which helps convert UV light to red light. It increases production of this thing called fibronectin, which is said to be the holy grail of anti-aging. And then there's astaxanthin, which has been shown in clinical studies to increase skin moisture, moisture retention, and elasticity. There's turmeric, which contains an antioxidant, anti-inflammatory, and antimicrobial properties. There's copper peptides, which also has antioxidant, anti-inflammatory effects. C60 has high antioxidant power to prevent skin aging, 172 times more than vitamin C. And then there's also geranium rose, shungite, humic acids, 
and most of these ingredients are organic and they're all high, high quality. So if you want to check this cream out, go to longev.com, that's L-O-N-G-E-V-V.com, or you can also find it on biolite.shop, that's biolite.shop. A couple things that I've noticed that make a difference with my HRV are eating too close to bed, so timing of eating, uh, drinking alcohol too close to bed, or even having more than usual, plenty of time before bed, but it still affects your sleep or HRV. And uh, yeah, like you said, mental stress can can really do a, a, a doozy on your, your HRV. And so the counter to that has been nasal breathing. So ever since I read a book by um, James Nestor called Breath and then interviewed Patrick McGowan, and I found out the importance of nasal breathing, the more consistently I nasal breathe, whether it's during exercise or just working in front of my computer, just day-to-day life, my HRV score shot up quickly when I started doing that versus mouth breathing. So that was a pretty simple hack to consistently increase my, my HRV. One other question I had about kind of the biometrics or the biostrap readings, but before we kind of dig into the, the biostrap lab study was there, there are quite a few times where my sleep score is phenomenal. It's in the mid to high 80s, maybe even low 90s, but then my recovery score might be in the 30s, 40s, 50s. So what is that telling me about my body that my sleep was phenomenal, but my recovery score was terrible? Uh, That you're really trying to recover from call it the previous day stressors, but you didn't quite get there, right? And so... When we look at sleep, there's really global indicators of what's good sleep versus bad sleep, right? When you look at the time of sleep, sleep efficiency, which is things like latency and number and duration of awakenings, movement, hypoxic events, snoring, we can globally score what's good sleep versus bad sleep. Whereas recovery comes down to you. How do you look today relative to yourself over a trailing 30-day baseline is typically what we'll use for our recovery score. So this could mean your body was exhausted and it got good deep sleep because of it. It's really fighting to restore, but you know, that one sleep session wasn't adequate to get you completely recovered. And so we get that question a lot. So we call it a little less than intuitive, but if it was one-to-one correlated, we'd only have one score. <laughs> right. And so what's, what's happening when, cause this is happening actually right now, where again, I'm getting really good sleep, but it's been four or five days in a row where I've had good sleep, but my recovery has been essentially 55 or lower. Does that mean I'm working too hard, not recovering enough? And, or is that some sort of indicator of an underlying illness coming on potentially? Um, you know, illness will generally affect your sleep patterns as well. So that's, that's not a, a you know, direct correlation. We can make the holiday Thanksgiving. We tend to overindulge. We tend to consume a little bit more alcohol. We throw up our you know, circadian rhythm. There's strong research to report that alcohol has an effect on your heart rate variability for approximately three to four days. So it's not like, you know, when the hangover goes away, I'm back to baseline. There's still your autonomic nervous system fighting to get back to baseline. So without knowing anything of what you've done over the last few days, that combined with, you know, you always stress. And I know holidays are probably a big time for, for your companies and everything like that. I paint the picture and say that probably has something to do with it. Yeah, that makes sense. So, so let's say it's even a glass of wine or one drink of beer. Is that enough to throw it off for three or four days? Or is it when you consume excessive amounts that that's the case? Um, excessive tends to be worse. This comes down to bio-individualization, right? Um, how our kidney, liver process alcohol, and you can do genetic testing to tell you how you're going to you know, metabolize alcohol and such. It affects everybody differently. And that's why it's hard to say wine is better than beer is better than grain alcohol or anything like that. We're all, we're all so unique. So I try to stay away from any, any type of binning like that. Counter to that, I think timing is extremely important for everybody. I can nutrition timing, alcohol timing, anything within a few hours prior to bed is going to have an, an impact on your sleep. How many hours would you say two or three or four? Is there, is there a certain, uh, cutoff time that is obvious to be a detriment if you consume anything outside of water before bed? Leaning on, I think it was Whoop's research, one of the studies I, I thought they did very well was around alcohol consumption. I believe they uh, pinpointed that four hours prior to bed. For, and is that alcohol. irregardless of the season? Let's say the sun doesn't go down till 9.30 or 10 at night versus nowadays it's it's dark by five. Does that play a role? I can see the season playing a little bit of a role more from a circadian perspective, but ultimately I think it has to go down to 
allotment of physiological resources? Is your body, you know, basically focusing on metabolizing alcohol and dedicating a lot of resources towards your kidney and your liver? Or is it able to, you know, focus on our lymphatic system and things like that to basically get your brain ready for the following day? So I think it just has to go down to, is it metabolized enough prior to going to sleep to where you can focus on these normal restorative processes? Gotcha. Okay. That makes sense. Well, let's, let's dig into the, to the research or to the study that Biostrap Labs and BioLite did, you know, speaking of stress, that that's kind of a good segue. So uh, for the audience, can you just give an overview of the process of the study before we get into the results, just kind of outlining what the study looked like from beginning to end, and then we can start to dig into some of the results we saw. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, you know, quick note on, on Biostrap Labs, it's essentially our contract research division. We have thousands of users that want to, you know, basically provide their de-identified data and participate in these types of studies. We have a major advantage that we have years of data on all of them. And so it takes amazing companies such as your own here to basically be willing to you know, invest some resources into validating your product. There, there's nothing in the wellness industry that says, you have to show that you can improve sleep before you, you know, put improved sleep on your product or anything like that. So it has to be like pioneers of the industry, such as yourself, which I, I think is amazing, right? Not too many people uh, will put the, the proof behind the pudding, if you will. So basically what we did here is we recruited a total of 25 participants to, to provide their data for this study. First metric that really stood out to me was compliance. 24 out of 25 completely followed the protocol, which included 10 minutes twice per day. Uh, one pretty close to upon awakening and one within about a, an hour prior to bed. So 96% compliance in a clinical research study is, is excellent. And that's just a testament to people feeling the effects of your product. So that's pretty awesome there. Ultimately, the way we structure these is you know, phase-based interventional trials. So we started with a two-week non-interventional baseline, meaning you're just wearing your bio strap. You're not changing your exercise nutrition. You're not starting bio light just quite yet. We want to understand kind of physiological set points. Then what we do is the four-week intervention phase four for your product here. So we did four weeks where essentially the individual would do 10 minutes, uh, you know, five minutes front and back each morning, uh, obviously very close to the panel. Um, in the morning is repeat that again in the evening. So we did that every day. Um, we required a minimum of five days, but ideally every day for the four-week duration. It's Just to interject, Kevin, that was with red and near infrared light, correct? Correct. Yes. Sorry. Red and Aaron Fred. Yep. And then we always look at a two week washout phase as well, which is very important, right? We understand, are you essentially reliant on the technology itself or do you have lasting physiological impact after we withdraw that? So two weeks of no intervention, four weeks of, you know, the infrared, near infrared, and then the two weeks of removing that as well. Basically, what we do here is we do different statistical methods. So we're going to do repeated measure and NOVAs and, and all these types of things. And basically, we're looking at interphase and intraphase trends. Ultimately, what we saw from a longitudinal perspective, meaning we're just tracking our data trends over time, decreased resting heart rate while sleeping, increased heart rate variability, and improved deep sleep. At the end of the four-week intervention, these were about as close to statistical significance without being as possible, meaning if we would have extended the study just a little bit more, we would have been able to really show that in, in a you know, population that there was statistically significant changes in resting heart rate, HRV, and deep sleep, which are extremely important to health, wellness, longevity, disease management. I think one of the more important measures that we found were actually the acute effects. So here we actually looked at running a five minute pulse report, basically all of our biometrics for five minutes um, before, then you did your intervention, and then you did a, in a repeat five minute report within a few minutes after completion. So this allows us to look at more of the immediate or acute effects of, of infrared and near infrared. Um, what we found here uh, to me was pretty amazing. Most importantly, what we saw was about a 12% increase in heart rate variability. So once again, resiliency, recovery, all of this is a function, but a 122% increase in high frequency heart rate variability. So this is where we get into actually trying to address the ambiguity of heart rate variability and understanding the sympathetic versus the parasympathetic. Heart rate variability is, is our best non-invasive measure of efferent parasympathetic activity, right? Rest, digest, relax, recover. I have personally never seen something in 10 minutes increase parasympathetic effort and activity by 122%. So this shows each individual session has a huge 
very statistically significant impact on, on something like stress. You know, we can make the case all day of why stress matters, but, you know, in a nutshell, that's what we came from a biometric perspective. You know, I'm sure you have some things to say, and then we can get a little bit into the kind of self-reported data as well. Kind of like what we talked about before we even started the study, you know, when we all had our Zoom calls with your team and and, and my team, and we we're kind of um, excited to get the study under underway because to our knowledge, this is the first, you know, red light therapy company to do some type of study or research on their own product. So we were excited about that, but then we were kind of wondering, you know, what's going to happen. You never know what to expect until it does happen. We had our hypotheses, what we thought should happen based on the current photobiomodulation or LLT research. But the results that we got that you just spoke about were kind of surprising. They were a little different than we might've anticipated, yet they are pretty darn exciting because there isn't a lot of photobiomodulation research, to my knowledge, and I'm sure, Kevin, you as well, uh, as much that you've been scouring the research uh, for the study, that there aren't a lot looking at HRV specifically, and which is the cool part about doing this uh, BioStrap lab study, is the biometrics that we get to track over the course of the study. And the big one, like we talked about, you know, the first you know 20 or 30 minutes, HRV and the importance of, of that metric alone. So that was a long-winded way of saying we got some really cool results, both like you said, longitudinal almost or long-term, almost a statistically significant results, basically there, but not you know technically, but the, the instantaneous or the spontaneous, I guess, enhancement or being tapped into your parasympathetic, like you said, only a 10-minute session and you're getting the 120% increase. I mean, that's phenomenal. Nothing I could have ever guessed that's something I thought I would have guessed would be accrued over time. Like, let's say you have to do red light therapy for several weeks to, you know, see this change in your parasympathetic nervous system, but it's with every session, 10 minutes, and you're decreasing your stress like that. So it's pretty amazing to see those results, to see those numbers, to see that, uh, you know, the BioLight panels are are producing those types of results for people. So that's kind of my little bit there. I don't know if you have anything else to add, but it was pretty exciting to see unique, different results we didn't anticipate, but very cool to see the results we did get. Yeah. Yeah. No, I was extremely pleased. I think, you know, certain things that we had hypothesized perhaps didn't quite get to the statistical significance, but that just comes down to learning, refining our protocol for, you know, the follow-up studies and such. But, you know, to, to your first point, everyone's so good at leaning on other people's research, but then talking about how their technology is different. Right. And so, you know, red infrared, near infrared, all these types of things are great. And here's all the research to validate it. But ours is better because we use a different wavelength. Oh, by the way, it's different wavelength. So it's not really validated. Right. And so, you know, once again, just a little testament to you guys, you know, really investing in this because can't tell you how many conversations, you know, lab studies we do where we disprove a product. And then I don't get to be a guest on a podcast and talk about all the amazing results and stuff. To your point about, you know, not too much research focusing on heart rate variability. And in circling to the self-reported improvements of your study here, uh, we saw a 40% uh, decrease in musculoskeletal pain, 23% increase in perceived recovery, uh, and, and decreased day-to-day -day soreness. That's what most people hang their hat on. They're going to say, we decrease muscle soreness, we decrease pain, blah, blah, blah. No one tends to care, except for researchers such as myself, the, the physiological mechanism. Right, without tracking all the heart rate variability in between, we'd have no idea why the muscle soreness is decreased. Now I know it's heart rate variability and better sleep. And I can, you know, basically tie one and one together, understand how your technology works. And now you guys know basically how to refine protocols and prescriptions and everything to treat people even better. And this is this is how we evolve the industry. And so that, that kind of begs the question based on the results of this study, again. Wish it could have been longer. Of course, we always wish we could have more people. But, you know, based on the results we got here, where would you want to see the next study going? Where would you want that to be directed towards? You know, I would definitely like to extend the, the intervention phase quite a bit. Ultimately, getting more into specific populations and understanding, you know, what, what your market is and everything a little bit. You know, is it uh, elite athletes that are going to get the most benefit? Or is it the individual with some sort of chronic disease? You know, so understanding, being able to subset this research into specific populations and understand the mechanism and the benefits there, I think is really, once again, how we learn how to prescribe it, market it, sell it all better. Yeah, and I'd also wonder, of course, you'd go <laughs> down so many different rabbit holes with, with the study once you get these types of results. But it's like, how, 
how would you know compounding different you know modalities enhance the hrv results like what if you know some people did meditation or other people did you know breath exercises or certain people were using this adjuvant or supplement a lot of different rabbit holes you could go down with the study so yeah it's really cool and like i said before you know in a perfect world it would have been you know like you said a longer study we probably would have gotten those statistically significant numbers uh, many many more people just to make the 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 research more robust but at the end of the day for for what it was and what we accomplished you know we got some pretty cool results and yeah again i couldn't be more excited to honestly get the results we did get cuz we're kind of paving a new way for for red light therapy all of research i mean there's thousands and thousands of studies but like you said nothing on nothing on hrv or really targeting stress so i think this is a whole new avenue people could go down yeah with with new products we have coming out even like the guardian I, again, I don't know if this is Biostrap specific, but just seeing what role improving the oral microbiome could have on uh, systemic health. So yeah, there's a lot of different areas we could we could go with this, but I'm really excited to have this first one um, under our belt. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Extremely exciting results. And like you said, paving the way for a, a whole new field of research. I'm really excited for it. Yeah, I appreciate that, Kevin. Yeah, is there anything else that would be worth noting about this study? Or, or just, you know, what you're doing biometrics in general that you want the audience to know? Um, you know, what, what I really see is stress is one of the biggest problems that everybody faces. And so the, the fact that we can find non-invasive, comfortable, fun, you know, whatever you want to call it, types of interventions here, it just has use cases in so many places, right? What we do at Biostrap is we can measure things like stress, but that is simply a means to an end. We're improving people's self-awareness. We're saying you're getting too stressed and you know risk is about to ensue, but you need technology such as yourself to be able to intervene and move that needle back to where it should be, or else we're just measuring data to measure data. And so this is really my mission is to you know help consumers make better decisions, you know, where they're spending their money and everything like that. But understanding I all I can really do is tell you what's wrong with you and perhaps a little bit of how to fix it, but I can't actually fix it myself as a biometric data scientist. So, you know, love that we were able to get these results. I hope there's a lot of amazing other lab studies too. And, you know, people start looking for something like Biostrap Labs validated when they're they're making these types of decisions because they know that these claims have something to them, right? And I I think that's, you know, the future of the wellness industry as I see it is is get get away from the bullshit and let's start validating these claims so people know what they're buying. Yeah, it's easy to get caught up in the hype of a new technology or, or the marketing. And so to have some awareness or to bring some, like you said, validation to a product or to a company, it just gives the consumer more confidence in what they're purchasing. Whereas for the most part, it's like, if you're trying to decide on a red light therapy company, like you're saying, everyone's espousing the current research or that they have certain lights or that they're doing certain things. But what does it really mean to the consumer? Um, same thing when pur- purchasing saunas it's like what's better is it the infrared is it full spectrum is it just the traditional you know finish a barrel sauna with electric heat it's kind of like we talked about at the beginning of the podcast it's kind of the the wild wild west in the sense that as a consumer you're having to do some really deep due diligence and dig through the trenches to get some substantial information on what differentiates one product from another if anything so like you're saying to have something like Bioshop Labs, where you guys are doing the research and and putting some scientific validation behind uh, certain products or technologies, I think is invaluable. So kudos to what you guys have been doing over there. Thanks, man. Appreciate it. Um, so Kevin, where can people go to learn you know, more about you or more from you? Um, we have our, our website, biostrap.com, um, at Bioshop on just about all the social media channels. I- I don't have any social media myself, so I'm not the right guy to ask, but um, no, <laughs> okay. I, we should be relatively easy to find. <laughs> gotcha. Awesome. Well, Kevin, again, appreciate your time hopping on the call here to really dive into to biometrics. That was a fun conversation and then kind of detailing the results of that BioLite study with Biostrap Labs. So appreciate your time. I'm sure our paths will cross again. And uh, yeah, for everyone listening, appreciate you making it all the way through. Hope it was interesting information. Uh, we will be... Uh, posting a lot of this information from the Biostrap Labs on on our website, social media, and whatnot coming out. So keep your eyes posted for that. Really wanted to do this podcast with Elias and Kevin first and uh, have you guys hear it first from, from the source. So without further ado, this is Kevin Longoria and Dr. Mike Belkowski signing off another episode of the Red Light Report. 
You all have a fantastic week. Thank you for listening to the Red Light Report. If you like what you heard today, go ahead and leave us a review on iTunes and other podcast platforms to help spread the word so other people can learn about the many health, wellness, and longevity benefits of red light therapy. If you're looking for more educational content, check out our Instagram page at biolight.shop and our YouTube channel, Biolight. I'm Dr. Mike Belkowski, and I'll see you on the next episode.